question about extension, dedicating herself to educating producers on the latest science-based findings. She also engages with youth and the broader community, raising awareness about the dairy industry's critical role. In today's webinar, Dr. Spencer will delve <laughs> Sorry, dive into neonatal management for dairy for beef on dairy programs, a vital area for improving crossbred calf outcomes. She'll cover the differences in managing crossbred calves and the economic and environmental advantages of such programs. Furthermore, she'll address the challenges and opportunities inherent in this innovative approach. So without further ado, I would like everyone to join us for Dr. Spencer as she shares her valuable insights drawing from her research and practical experiences to guide us through the complexities of beef on dairy management. And with that, Dr. Spencer, I'll let you take over. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'll go ahead and share my PowerPoint. So as Ellie mentioned, I'll be discussing some of the neonatal management strategies in order for a successful beef on dairy crossbred system. So some of the things that I'll be talking about today are key considerations, um, how to ensure the health and well-being of these crossbred calves, the importance of colostrum, and also strategies for intake of colostrum, uh, preventative health measurements, health monitoring practices, nutrient requirement differences, uh, also the benefits that dairy operations see from this, the sustainability and profitability of the system, and the challenges and opportunities that exist. So some of the key considerations are colostrum management, hygiene, environmental uh, challenges, monitoring, and nutrition. Really, I wanna emphasize on colostrum management. It's extremely important. We think about the three cues, so quality, quantity and quickness of colostrum, which I'll discuss further. Also the hygiene environment. Once these calves are born, we want them born into a clean, dry environment in order to prevent any disease or disease spread. And then of course, having um, shelter from any elements, whether elements, um, the heat or cold. Um, and monitoring these calves regularly for any signs of illnesses or distress. Uh, that's extremely important in order to prevent any diseases or to catch any illness early on and be able to treat it in a timely manner. And then also nutrition. You wanna make sure that these beef dairy crossbred calves are getting the right nutrients, which are unique. Uh, they're different from the purebred Holstein or the purebred dairy and the purebred beef breeds, uh, making sure that we have enough nutrients in that diet to meet or exceed the nutrient requirements. So in order to ensure that there's the health and well-being of these calves, just like any other calf, uh, scheduling regular veterinary care. So making sure that working with your veterinarian in order to come up with vaccination schedules, how to you know, implement biosecurity measurements. It's extremely important to work with your veterinarian to create these standard operating procedures. And just like a veterinarian, also consulting with a nutritionist in order to make sure that those calves are getting the right amount of nutrients that meets or exceeds what they need and that the feed is being given properly. Um, we think about, you know, buckets. We think about buckets, the feed, the starter feed being in, you know, black buckets or not being dumped, um, things like that. It's extremely important to make sure that these calves remain healthy. Um, as mentioned, working with your veterinarian uh, for biosecurity protocols, there's a lot of online resources as well that can help create a biosecurity protocol, but these are absolutely essential in order to prevent disease and also disease transmission throughout all the calves. And with disease, we got to think about stress. So just like you and I, we get stressed, we're more likely 
to get sick um, because those stress levels kind of reduce our uh, immune system response. So, you know, whenever I get sick uh, during flu season, it's usually during the time that I'm extremely stressed. Um, other ways that we can reduce stress with these calves are through gentle handling. So making sure those employees are trained in order to handle these calves in a proper manner to reduce stress um, and create you know, calm environment. So going into colostrum, colostrum is essential. We need to make sure that it's being delivered in a timely manner, the quality is great, and also they're getting enough colostrum in order for them to develop a passive immunity um, through the colostrum and get the antibodies from the mother. Um, this is also essential because these nutrients are needed in order for the digestive system to actually develop. So beyond the you know, immunity, it helps the development of the digestive system. So when we talk about colostrum, it's very common in the industry to talk about the three cues of colostrum management. So quickness, quality, and quantity. When we talk about quickness, that means how quickly these calves are getting colostrum after birth. And really, we want to get this in. I mean, it's better to do it within an hour after being born. But as we all know on operations, dairy operations, it's really hard. And you know, with labor, making sure you have enough labor, it can be difficult. But getting it in within two hours after birth is ideal. That's really what you are shooting for. And no more than six hours, but you know, four hours would even be the max that you'd want to go. And I'll show um, a graph showing why that is on the next slide. Um, quality of colostrum. Do you want to make sure that they're getting the right amount or the right quality of this colostrum? So testing colostrum, once it's collected, from the cow in a clean manner, right? We wanna make sure that the udder is clean, that we check to make sure that there's no mastitis. Um, we measure it for the quality and we want high quality greater than 50 grams per liter. And a common way that that is done is using a refractometer, right? So you put in a little bit of the colostrum and then it'll tell you um, the, amount that's in the colostrum. And a lot of dairies, you know, which is understandable, feed high quality or excellent colostrum to their replacement heifers. And I mean, that is completely understandable. However, these beef on dairy calves, they undergo a lot of stress. So these calves are leaving the herd you know, within a day or a couple of days, even the same day that they're born that creates that stress that I was talking about that makes them susceptible to diseases. So ensuring that they're getting enough of those antibodies and the quality of that colostrum is high can help that calf uh, have a higher response or respond um, more accurately to a disease challenge. Quantity, Getting enough of this colostrum in is also very, very important. We usually shoot for 10% of the body weight or 12% of the body weight, um, three to four quarts during that. Um, usually three quarts, we think about jerseys because they're smaller framed, um, four quarts, more Holstein. So these are absolutely essential when beef on dairy calves are being handled on the dairy. Um, feeding methods. So on the picture on the right shows an esophageal tube. Um, getting that in in a timely manner sometimes can be challenging if these calves won't suckle. You see that a lot too if they're born from a dystocia event. These calves are weaker, right? They just went through a traumatic experience. Those are ones too that also need 
you know, high quality colostrum, they've gone under a lot of stress. So when they're getting exposed to the environment um, and being exposed to any disease that's there, these dissocia calves um, can have a higher risk of getting disease. But trying to get them to suckle is the best way to do it because then they're getting used to being fed through the bottle and suckling later on. Um, but if need be, definitely use an esophageal tube in order to make sure that they are getting all of the colostrum that they need. So I spoke a little bit about quickness. Now this is showing that the percent of immunoglobulin absorption or those antibodies that are being transferred shortly after birth on the hours, we have the hours on the x-axis and then the percentage of immunoglobulin absorption on the y-axis. And as you can see, after the hours after birth, the percent of immunoglobulin absorption significantly decreases. And you can really see like after four, it declines, but after six, it really does decrease uh, the percent that's gonna be absorbed by that calf. And actually at 24 hours, um, the gut closes. So the immunoglobulins will not be able to be absorbed by that calf. So if colostrum is not even given within the 24 hours, then they aren't gonna be getting any of those um, antibodies transferred over. And if this happens, we get a failure of passive immunity transfer, which is which increases the risk of mortality or death. So this graph is showing um, on the x-axis, we have days of age and on the y, the percent of survival. And this is based on serum IgG concentrations. So when we look at whether or not they've gotten the right quantity, we can measure that using serum by taking blood samples and measuring the serum immunoglobulin concentrations or total protein concentrations. So if the IgG concentrations are greater than 1000 milligrams per deciliter, then they have 3% mortality risk. Whereas if it's less than 1000 milligrams per deciliter, that mortality risk increases to 8% which is huge. I mean, if you think about 100 going from three to eight mortality rate, that's five calves, that has a significant impact on profitability. So making sure quality and the quantity and the quickness of this colostrum being fed is going to help create a successful beef on dairy program. Other preventative measurements, healthcare measurements, is making sure that there's a regular vaccine uh, schedule, always consulting with your veterinarian on creating those operating protocols, when to give them, um, what days of age, um, if these calves are going on to you know, grass, grazing, maybe implementing deworming program, Nutritional management, so meeting or exceeding those nutritional requirements and monitoring these calves regularly. On a dairy, calves are being you know, monitored morning and night, um, being fed that colostrum. But when we think about them going to a backgrounding, they also are getting that, but it is extremely important your employees know the signs of illness or distress in these calves so we can prevent diseases instead of treating. We always think about just treating diseases, but prevention should be the goal, not treatment. So some of those monitoring practices that can be implemented are observations. Monitoring them regularly, knowing the signs of distress, the abnormal behaviors that may be occurring, um, any signs of illness, so diarrhea, um, maybe coughing, 
want to know what abnormal behaviors or illnesses are being observed in these calves and definitely recording that for each calf. Um, whenever I think of any you know, beef or dairy operation, I swear they have better records than me at my doctor's office. They have great records. So it's extremely important we record any signs of illness, any signs of abnormal behavior, and training your employees to look for those can have a huge impact. Um, and that's where you can get that prevention versus treatment. And if, you, if treatment is required, treating in a timely manner is really going to help to reduce mortality or even spread uh, transfer to other calves. Um, other ways to monitor the success of a beef on dairy uh, management or strategy is tracking the growth, the average daily gain. These calves, the beef dairy crossbred calves are going to grow at a different rate than purebred dairy or purebred beef. They're kind of in the middle. So by monitoring their weight gain, um, and growth rates, we can have a better program. And again, making sure your vet, you're checking up with your vet, you're having, you know, those protocols that are needed. Now, I'm sure um, we'll go into this a little bit more in the next presentation, but there are nutritional requirement differences. So as I mentioned, purebred beef, purebred dairy, crossbreds are kind of in the middle. So they do have different growth rates, different uh, muscle development compared to those purebreds, and they may need more energy dense diets in order to support that rapid growth and muscle development. And this really does start with colostrum. As soon as these are born, we, we need that gut development. We need them to not only have those antibodies, but we need them to have that gut development to be able to absorb these nutrients. Um, but by creating more of a specialized uh, nutrition program for these crossbreds can have a huge impact on you know, the success of these calves and also maximizing what they can do. Uh, and so the size impacts of maturity, this is kind of just a general, um, you have on the y-axis weight, so as weight increases, and on the x, the age of the calf. So as they age, they start to increase their weight, so development of uh, skeletal and then the muscle development. But if you look at large frames, so thinking more of like Holstein, calves versus smaller frames, so maybe Angus, um, the mature body weight occurs at an earlier age, but a lower weight, right? This is really important when it gets into you know, feedlot or even backgrounding. If you're able to get these to a mature body weight early, it reduces the number of days on feed, which can increase prof profitability. So these crossbred calves are really helping kind of bring those large frame you know, Holstein calves down, you know, closer to the beef in order to create a more uh, profitable system. And the benefits really to the dairy farmers and even speaking to some of these dairy farmers, you know, they've said sex semen is pretty much, it's a common practice. We use sex semen on you know, heifers, those that have higher fertility, helps to improve genetics quickly. And since that's become more common, we want to, they want some kind of value out of the other calves that they don't need, right? If they're using conventional semen. So the use of beef semen has been wonderful for producers. Um, it creates an alternative revenue stream, they're getting more value from these calves because these calves are in, you know, they're closer than a purebred 
dairy to a purebred beef, um, which can increase you know, the value by reducing at days on feed. Um, they also are desirable by you know, processors or processing plants because they fit on the rails better. The meat quality um, is better compared with those purebred dairies, dairy um, calves and cows. And also this system has been really beneficial to dairy producers because they're able to utilize the resources that they have reduce the you know impact of having just a calf that they're pretty much trying to sell to get rid of because cows in order to lactate they have to have a calf so by creating this system or this management strategy has really you know been beneficial for these dairy producers to maximize their profitability on something that has to happen in order for a dairy to function. So sustainability and profitability of this system has been seen uh, widespread. Uh, the economic efficiency, I mean, calves, Jersey calves, we always hear they're pretty much trying to pay somebody to take them. Um, Holstein calves are $50. And then when you think about beef, these producers could get like $200 a calf. And that is substantial. If you're paying the same amount for semen, if you're getting four times the money for that calf. That means a lot. Also, this system has helped um, with meeting the market demand. So creating a product that consumers want to see or want to eat, right? We usually see, you know, a steak in the store and we're used to seeing that type of steak. So when you're putting, you know, a Holstein that's larger, may not have as much intermuscular fat or um, doesn't have a lot of fat around the edges, it just, it's not desirable. It's not what we've seen in the store and not necessarily what we would go for. And also reducing um, the waste. I mean, these calves have to be born. So these crossbred calves have been well, godsend, really. And when we're talking about growth rate, growth being greater, um, it reduces the footprint. So reduces the greenhouse gases. And this is because growth rates are better. We're reducing the resources and we're maximizing what producers are getting from these calves and reducing the resources that they need. However, there are some challenges, but there are a lot of opportunities. Um, there is a knowledge gap, in my personal opinion, a knowledge gap between, um, you know, dairy producers understanding the beef side of things. Understandable. They're not beef producers, right? They're dairy producers. So we need to be able to provide them with training and resources, which this is a great example of provi providing training and resources for dairy and beef producers to kind of understand. And I can't say this enough, but communication is absolutely essential in order for a beef on dairy program to be successful um, for both beef and dairy producers. Um, dairies talking with backgrounders, what are they seeing? Are they seeing more diseases? Do the dairy producers need to verify that they're giving enough you know, colostrum in a timely manner, that they've recorded that, given that to the backgrounder. Um, feedlots also giving their feedback, what is happening after like maybe, you know, that sire with that cow does not perform well or grow at a, you know, desirable weight. Um, and then packing plants, making sure that you're meeting their demands. Maybe they want, you know, a different type of product that's got, you know, higher yield or quality. So working with them can really help with making informed decisions on the dairy side and breeding um, and being able to sell these products, these byproducts essentially at a higher price, you know, but resource allocation to these crossbred calves, um, 
it takes space and it takes flavor. You know, training your employees, absolutely essential on any operation, making sure they understand the importance of colostrum um, and the environment that they're in, keeping it clean. And as we all know, there's labor shortages, but you know, getting them trained, having them pay attention to the details um, is extremely important. So that does take time, um, but there is opportunity for that. If you're getting more money for these, I mean, you can dedicate, create training for these employees um, in order to get that profitability. Um, and also kind of tailoring those management strategies and nutritional requirements for these crossbred calves. Um, that's gonna create a challenge. I mean, it's different than purebred um, beef or dairy. So understanding the health and the management strategies, nutrition wise, any other management strategy is very important in order to maximize a beef on dairy system. So overall, it's important to remember that neonatal care is a huge impact on the rest of the beef dairy crossbred calves life. How it performs, um, you know, illness, mortality, we want to start them off on the right foot. Can't emphasize this enough, colostrum is extremely important. Making sure that just because these are beef dairy and they're not going back onto the dairy is extremely important to give them the right quality, quantity, and in a timely manner. So always keep in mind those three cues of colostrum management. And understanding that nutrient requirements are different. So they may require more energy for muscle development and growth compared to purebred dairy. And also working with the beef side of the system can help producers, dairy producers, meet the demands of the beef side of um, a beef on dairy system. Maintaining that communication is absolutely essential. Also reaching out can really help producers on both sides. Um, looking at extension resources, talking to your veterinarian, nutritionist, I mean, even each other, other producers. Um, I think this is a great example of extension providing information, but make sure that if you have a question, reach out because we can help you figure out the answer. Um, and provide resources. Truly, I believe that produ dairy producers, it would be important for us to create a training for them to understand the beef side of the market, have beef producers come in, tell them what they want. Um, so dairy producers can produce a beef on dairy calf that meets the demands, not only for the consumer, but also for those backgrounders, feedlots, and the processing facilities. So with that, um, I think we're gonna hold off on questions until after uh, the next presenter. But... Yes, thank you, Dr. Spencer. Um, we will be doing all of the questions at the end of um, Olivia's presentation as well. So Dr. Spencer will join us back and um, she'll answer any of the questions from her presentation or any other ones that come about. So thank you, Dr. Spencer, again. Thank you. Um, and with that, our next presenter is um, Olivia Genther Schroeder. Olivia received a master's degree in animal science studying dairy cattle and ruminant nutrition from Michigan State University. And then she completed a PhD from Iowa State University studying trace mineral nutrition in feedlot cattle. Olivia joined um, Perina's Dairy Feed uh, Research and Development Team in 2017 and is currently the Senior Manager of the Dairy Feed Research, where she is researching nutritional impacts on the health and performance of dairy and beef on dairy cattle. And with that, I will let Dr. Schroeder take it from here. Thank you, Allie. 
All right, so I am going to continue on what Dr. Spencer was talking about. We're going to dive a little bit more deeply into how we feed these calves and, how, and, and what impact that has on how these calves perform, really focusing on the pre-weaning period um, and then through about 12 weeks. Let me get it to work. Okay, uh, I want to start, though, with why we should care about how this young animal is being fed and really what difference this can make long term. So we're going to dive just a little bit into just how important that neonatal and pre period is. Because what we're doing is we're really setting the stage for how this animal is going to perform, perform long term. And I think we need to better understand what the consequences of missing out on this critical period are. So I want to talk a little bit about this term called metabolic imprinting. This is actually a term that does come from the beef world. Um, and it's about biological responses that, um, to a nutritional intervention early in life that permanently alters physiological outcomes later in life. So basically something that we can do nutritionally early on that actually has a strong physiological um, change in that animal long term. Um, so thinking about how important it is to how we feed these animals and what that means. So why should we focus on the neonatal and preweaning period? Well, it's because there is a lot of really critical um, uh, processes that are happening and developing. I'm going to start with the gut. Um, the gut development in the first few hours, days, weeks, and even months of life is very, very critical for determining how that gut is going to be able to, um, to uh, function long term. We are building that physical barrier of the gut, incredibly important to maintain that um, nice tight gut and prevent leaky gut. Um, we're developing that physical barrier, but we're also developing the immune tissue that's associated with that gut. And remember that 70% of our immune system is actually in our gut, and that is true in our animals as well. Um, and so we're developing that immune system in that gut if that calf is really young. We're also developing the microbiome, right? Um, in our young animals, this is our best opportunity to have a long-term impact in what that gut is going to look like. Um, so we can we can make some of these changes um, that, that actually last long term. So those can be good things like really good quality colostrum, um, awesome oligosaccharides and things that come along with that colostrum, but it can also be whatever's on the bottom of the maternity barn floor, right? So that's why it's so important for sanitation, especially for these very young animals. We're really developing that gut. That ha that's our only really opportunity to have a long term impact. The immune system is developing. So even outside of the gut, we know about paths of transfer. Dr. Spencer just talked about that and how critical it is for the health of our animals. But once paths of transfer and the immunity that they get from mom starts to decrease, the calf is developing their own immune system. And they're growing those really critical organs that are associated with the immune system during this very early period. Muscle development and adipocyte development are also occurring during this period. Fetal development and programming of these components is especially important. So I don't want to downplay that. But during the very early period of life, we do have an opportunity to build some of the cells that are going to be important for allowing that ribeye area to grow the way that we want it to, as well as to develop those cell populations that will eventually become the adipocytes that fill and create marbling, all of the things that we want in these growing beef animals. And then the last thing I want to talk about is just growth. If we feed these young animals appropriately, they will grow like little weeds, and they're incredibly efficient during their early life, more efficient than they will ever be um, down the road. And so we don't want to miss out on the opportunity just to grow these animals as well. And nutrition can have impacts on every single one of these individual components. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go deeply into those. But I do want to talk about how we know that the things that we do in early life impact animals long term. I'm going to start with some of the consequences of poor growth and stressors pre weaning. And Slime has done a really, really great job of understanding um, how what we do to that very young animal, how that impacts their long term performance. So, for example, early weaning in piglets, so we're talking about early uh, weaning before 21 days of age. Um, that will increase gut permeability at weaning. Um, we know that that happens in cattle as well. Um, but it actually increases gut permeability all the way out to 12 to 13 weeks of age. So much, much longer than when we created that very initial insult to that gut. 
they also find that uh, reduced feed efficiency and increased mortality all the way to market age. So something that happened in that very, very young animal having a significant impact long term. In beef cattle, we know that pro, uh, pro, excuse me, poor growth during the pre weaning period, you can see that example there, uh, 0.66 pounds less through 215 days of age. That poor growth led to reduced carcass weight reduced retail yields and increased fatness when followed by high concentrate diet. So when we feed, when we um, try to make up for some of that poor growth early on, we can try to do that later because compensatory gain is, is a real thing. Um, unfortunately, the composition of that gain is quite different. And as that animal gets older, for every pound they gain, they will gain more of a larger proportion of fat. So when we try to make up for poor early growth by trying to grow them faster later, that typically is what happens. We understand this in the dairy industry pretty well. Um, we know that uh, based on multiple re uh, university studies that increasing average daily gain from birth to weaning and from birth to breeding actually leads to increases in first lactation milk. So again, early life nutrition and, and better gain during early life leading to increased milk production down the road. And some of our own data that we've got um, in collaboration with Oklahoma State, where we fed two different planes of nutrition here, you can see a commercial plane of nutrition. This is very commonly fed at most of our calf um, ranches. And when I say 1.25 pounds here, what I mean is 1.25 pounds of dry matter from a milk replacer, because we are hand feeding these calves, um, versus a high plane of nutrition, which is two and a half pounds. Um, of powder from milk replacers, so quite different. These would be both through um, seven weeks of age. When we finished, when we brought those calves all the way to finish, we were able to finish a few more of those high plane calves, but we were also able to get a little better quality out of those high plane calves, seeing more calves on the high plane that graded choice versus calves that were fed the commercial plane of nutrition. Some additional data from uh, the work that we've continued to do with Oklahoma State indicates that both average daily gain just from zero to 12 weeks, as well as their weight at 12 weeks, they're positively correlated with things like average daily gain through finishing hot carcass weight and ribeye area. So just 12 weeks of age in an animal that's being finished out, you know, year uh, to 14 months later, um, those, those time points and that that growth early on being critical to how that animal is going to perform long term. So why should we worry about early life? Well, it is a challenge. Um, raising calves is not easy. Um, for those of you who aren't as familiar, you know, on the, in the beef world, we're really lucky because we have mama cow. She's going to do a great job of raising that calf. She's going to provide that calf probably anywhere from 2.2 to 3 pounds of dry matter from milk going to feed them multiple times a day. Gonna, that's going to do, do that for a really long time. Um, whereas in our, our hand-fed calf raising industry, we're probably only going to feed them twice a day. And as I mentioned, a commercial plant nutrition is more about 1.25 pounds of uh, milk replacer. And then we're going to wean them much, much earlier. Um, calves are being weaned anywhere from 35 days to the average kind of in the 56 to 60 days range. So very, very different. Um, and raising calves is not easy. Um, but it is a really, really big opportunity, and we, um, we don't want to miss out on that opportunity. Um, so again, just to recap kind of why calf raising is important, um, it, is, it is a critical period for de developing that gut, a gut that we need to be reliable for the rest of that animal's life. Um, there's critical muscle and adipocyte development occurring during that period and efficiency. These little calves will gain 93% lean. They're very, very efficient. Um, of course, they are the most sensitive to change and challenges. Things that we do to our young calves that might um, slow them down from eating or make them sick, um, it, it's a lot easier to do that, unfortunately, in young animals than it is in older animals. And of course, you don't get a second chance. You don't have another opportunity to raise that animal. Um, so we consider the base of successful calf raising nutrition, um, and that will allow appropriate nutrition allows for that animal to grow their microbiome, uh, work on their immunity, as well as their gut. Okay, so I'm going to get a little bit into our program and just kind of how we went through the process of developing the program, really understanding on how to feed this young animal. So in our beef cross program, we've been doing research in this area for over four years now. 
We've run over 2,800 crossbred calves through our facility. Um, we have a facility that allows us to individually raise 172 calves at a time, um, as well as an auto feeder facility that allows us to raise an additional 40 calves. We've run 38 total trials from both high health and moderate health animals, one from a, uh, a, about five or six sources, and then more recently, a commingled calf model that includes a lot of sources in most cases, so high and moderate health. Um, every one of these calves has been shipped to our facility in Grace Summit, Missouri from at least eight hours away. So there's also that additional challenge on top of these calves, but very, very common in the industry. So as we started our program, our first question was really, are these calves different from Holsteins? We've got years and years and thousands and thousands of head of, of Holstein research. We wanted to understand what makes these calves different. So what we're going to be looking at here is a multi-study comparison. We've run, as I mentioned before, many, many studies across multiple study lengths, ranges of milk replacer plant and nutrition, so anywhere from feeding one and a half pounds of milk. Um, that's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood about four, um, four quarts. Um, just for reference, um, up to two and a half pounds of uh, milk powder per day. That's gonna be in the eight to nine quarts of milk, so really doubling, just for reference for liquid feeding. Um, all of these calves would have been from the same source. Um, from the same set of, of Holstein dams. So the Holsteins would have come out of the same source of Holstein dams as the crossreds did. So if we look at all of these animals and we correct for all those differences in studies, what we do see is we see that our crossreds in general tend to, to gain a little bit better on the same program. So you can see when we set all things equal, those um, crossbred calves tend to gain a little bit better during that period. They also tend to be more feed efficient. In general, we find that they also consume starter feed more aggressively. They're gonna start picking up on starter feed a little faster than their whole team counterparts. Now, these calves were very, very healthy, the pool of calves that we're talking about here. So we didn't see huge differences in treatment, but you can in general see that those, those crossbred calves tend to be a little bit healthier than their Holstein counterparts as well. In general, we see things like um, lower uh, lower scours rates and, and just a few a couple fewer treatments. Again, in, in, in a population where both the Holsteins and the crossbreds were very, very healthy. One thing that I think is interesting here is really the composition of these animals. So we've been doing ultrasound on these very young animals. Um, and, and what I think is cool is it, it really does fit with what you would expect from these genetics. So along the left, now these are animals on two different studies, but on the same plane in nutrition, um, this would be one and a half pounds of solids um, for seven weeks. We have a couple of different uh, endpoints. So we've got an ultrasound measurement at two weeks for our crossbreds and seven weeks. Um, and then eight weeks for our whole team. But what I think is interesting, is even though this animal has been fed for uh, six more weeks than this two week old animal, you can see that at two weeks, our crossbred animals already have the same ribeye area as a, an eight week old whole team. So of course they come with more musculature, which makes sense given that they are half beef. Um, what you can see is that at seven weeks of age, so that's even a week earlier than these whole scenes, um, they, are, they have almost an inch more ribeye area, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when we're going from two inches to three inches, it's a very large increase in ribeye area. So we see more musculature in our crossbred animals. If we compare that to fat, uh, crossbreds tend to come in with a little bit more fat relative to their Holsteins. Again, I think that makes sense relative to beef versus Holstein genetics, and we do see an increase in that. But critically, if we look over here at body weight, we can see that at the seven-week and eight-week time points, there are no differences between the crossbred and Holstein in this particular example. Now, again, this calf is one week older, so that does make a difference. So this calf at eight weeks probably did have greater body weight, but you can see that it's the same body weight that crossbred calf has significantly more musculature, more ribeye area, because their composition of gain is different. What we would find in our Holsteins is we would find greater hip height in our Holsteins. And I do, we do have that data, I just don't have those slides up here. Um, so Holsteins, because of their genetics, are gonna prioritize frame growth, whereas those crossbreds have much more beef influence and they're gonna prioritize protein growth a little bit more. So we find in general that crossbreds are different from Holsteins. They are generally more feed efficient, generally healthier. As I mentioned, they're more aggressive to consume starter grain, and they have greater muscling from the beginning. And we typically see less height gain and more weight gain on the same feeding program. 
So we determined that it does make sense to feed them differently. Their composition is different and that's critical, but probably even more critical is that the goals are different from raising this animal. This is an animal that I don't want to have in my herd in five and six years of age, right? I want that for my whole team. I don't want that for my beef cross. My goal is very different. So as we worked to try to understand how we should feed these, um, these animals, during the pre-weaning period, the most critical factor that influences growth is how much milk or milk replacer we're feeding to these cats. Again, these are hand-fed animals. These are animals, the only animals we really limit feed, milk or liquid feed. Um, so we wanted to see what that looked like. So again, this is a multi-study comparison. We're looking through just the weaning period in these data. Um, on the left here would be the milk replacer feeding rate in pounds of solids. So you can see 1.2 pounds of solids here, all the way up to that two and a half pounds of solids. And then the second line here would be weaning age. So were they weaned at 49 days or were they weaned at 56 days? As we look at these data, I think they probably tell you what we would expect. As we provide more nutrition to our calves, we get better average daily gain out of them. So total body weight gain will increase. And of course that average daily gain increases as well. Um, we're just, we're giving them more groceries. It's, it's, I always tell all of our dairy producers, you know, it's just, it's not rocket science. If you feed them more, they grow better. We also see a small increase in hip height um, gain during it for those animals. Um, so I wanna be clear though, when we're talking about hip height gain, yes, if we feed them more, they do get a little bit taller. But if we look down here at this measurement, which is hip height gain per unit of body weight gain. So for every pound of body weight I gain, how much hip height do I get for that? Um, and you can see that that's actually greater for those lower planes of nutrition relative to those higher planes of nutrition, because yes, we do get more hip or frame growth in those animals we feed more, but we get so much more body weight that really hip height gain is proportional to what we're feeding. Um, these animals are going to gain frame no matter what. They're young animals. That's what they're designed to do. Um, and as we typically see, we, um, as we feed more milk replacer to our animals, milk or milk replacer, we see a decrease in feed to gain. These animals become more efficient the more we feed them milk. And again, that makes sense. These are babies. They're designed to digest milk and milk solids. Um, and, and so they're, they're, do, they do a better job with efficiency. Now, of course, critically, we need to understand how much this costs. It's a very cost-sensitive industry. Um, and unfortunately, feeding those really high rates of milk replacer can be more expensive. I am not going to lie. Milk and milk replacer, they're expensive. And while it may be the best thing for the calf, sometimes we have to balance that between what we're getting at the end and how much we have to pay for something like that. So what we find in this example is that there's a huge difference in weaning age. So going from seven weeks to eight weeks of age, that has a huge impact on feed cost per pound of gain. Um, as well as the increase in solids. So even though we are paying less for milk here because we're not feeding nearly as much milk, feed cost per pound of gain is significantly lower because these calves just don't gain particularly well. Now, these calves, if we compare these to seven weeks versus eight weeks, they are different ages. So if we put everybody at the same, um, the same age, so these are data through 12 weeks of age, um, we see that Overall average daily gain over that 12 week period is actually uh, just about greatest for our 1.8 pounds um, at eight weeks of age. While our feed cost per pound of gain is no different than some of those lower planes of nutrition and actually lower than that typically commercially fed program. One of the, the keys to this is we actually see these calves that are weaned at eight weeks of age instead of seven weeks of age, they're more aggressive to consume that starter feed, which is very, very important. They do have a better job. The older that animal is, the better job they do transitioning through the weaning period. So even pushing back weaning by just a single week has a very large impact on how these animals perform. And I want to show some pictures because I think that pictures tend to be very impactful. And it's one of the really neat things that you can see as you walk through a barn um, where you're feeding different planes of nutrition. You can see um, what we've got here is a high plane of nutrition. So this would be that two and a half pounds of milk um, first is a conventional program. So this would be 1.5 pounds. So not all the way down at the bottom, but kind of the moderate program. And what 
you can really see in these weaning pictures is the calves that are fed more amounts of milk, you can see that in their structure, much more filling out through the hindquarter and then over the top as well. Just really seeing the influence, we're just getting much more ribeye area and, and musculature in these calves that are being fed more nutrition. And I want to be clear, these are not just the best high calves and the poorest conventionally fed calves. These are calves that are representative of the average of the treatment. A couple of other additional details that I want to mention. Um, if we talk about feed composition, what we find in these animals is that they respond very, very well to increases in crude protein. And that makes sense because of their ability to build muscle, which requires large amounts of protein, um, they respond very well to that. So in this example, we're looking at milk replacer of moderate protein versus high protein. So in this case, we're talking about 25% of the dry matter basis um, as fed, or excuse me, dry matter. Um, and about 27%. Uh, so just two points of crude protein difference between the two different planes of nutrition. But you can see that those calves that got more protein, they gained better and they tended to eat more starter. We also had a tendency for a reduction in feed to gain of about 3.3%. So they're very efficient in utilizing protein in these young animals. So we don't want to short them on protein. The other thing that I think is very important to mention is that as we increase, the amount of milk that we're feeding to these calves, we do need to increase the protein because as we shift away from just providing maintenance amounts um, of, of energy and protein, if we shift to growing that animal, um, protein really becomes limiting. So the amount of, or the ratio of crude protein to fat that you can feed in that lower plane of nutrition, you really need to shift that in that higher plane of nutrition. So if we might be feeding a 20% crude protein and a 20% fat milk replacer, or a 22% crude protein and 20% fat milk replacer in those low 1 to 1 1.2, maybe 1 1.5 pound feeding rates, when we get up to that 1.8 or even up to that 2.5, we have to have more crude protein just to for that animal to be able to utilize it appropriately. Similarly, starter, I have not focused a lot on starter in this presentation, but starter is incredibly critical. These cows I mentioned before, they're aggressive to consume feed, so the feed that they, they consume and that we offer them should also be very high quality. In this example, we're talking about moderate protein at about 18% on an as-fed basis versus a high protein starter at about 20% on an asset basis. And we see that again, the amount of money that we spend in increasing the protein, we basically get back in body weight gain in these animals. So they gain more, they have greater starter intake, and we saw about a 5% reduction in feed to gain. So the money that we spend on protein is well spent in these animals. Okay, so that is really how we have developed our crossbred program and trying to understand how to feed these calves and what that means with the goal in mind of getting them to 300 pounds. That has been our program goal to this point. Um, really trying to make sure how can we get back, how can we pay back the person who's actually raising these calves. Um, but as I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation, what we are doing in these very young calves does have an impact long term. So we've started shifting our program a little bit to try to understand we're dialing more in on the early growth so we can better understand some of the development in these animals. And then we're following these animals long term at places like Oklahoma State um, to better understand what does that mean for long term. So in this example, uh, we're looking again at plane of nutrition at four weeks of age. We've got pictures of calves. All of these tr treatments run at exactly the same time. Um, you can see that at four weeks of age, we do have pretty significant differences in, um, in body weight in these calves. So the commercially fed calves down here at 120 pounds, um, then at four weeks, these high plant nutrition calves being up at 149 pounds, and then our crossbred program uh, feeding 1.8 pounds of milk at 132 pounds. So again, it makes sense you feed them more, they grow more, and you can see what some of those differences look like. But if we dial in, on some of that very early growth, I really want to focus on the first two weeks. And as I mentioned before, there are a lot of very, very critical processes that are happening in these very young animals. We're programming very important things. We're programming gut development. We're programming immune system development. We're developing satellite cells for muscles down the road. 
Um, and there are some really big differences in animals that are fed a commercial plant nutrition. Again, this is very, very commonly fed in the industry versus higher plants of nutrition. So if we look at average daily gain for the first two weeks, we can see that these calves that are being fed that commercial plant nutrition just don't really grow. Over here, we're looking at gain to feed. This is not feed to gain. So gain to feed where um, lower is, is worse um, because Unfortunately, we have some negative feed to gains where they didn't gain anything or they lost weight and they still ate. Um, you can see that these calves, especially in the first 14 days, are not nearly as feed efficient as our other planes of nutrition, which makes sense. Again, they're, they're, they don't have the opportunity to compensate with dry feed starter intake. Calves are not eating starter in the first 14 days. They eat very little in the first three weeks, especially even when you short them um, on milk replacer. But what I think is even more interesting is if we look at, um, up here at the day, we've got, again, those three planes of nutrition. You can see what those actual average daily gains were for the first 14 days. But what we find is that 37% of the calves on that commercial plane of nutrition either didn't gain anything or actually lost weight during the first two weeks. We repeated that in a follow-up study looking at just the commercial plane nutrition and the high plane nutrition, but you can see that the first 14-day average daily gain is very, very similar between the two different studies. And again, we find that 41% of those calves fed that commercial plane of nutrition either lost, either didn't gain anything or lost weight. And so I'd like to think we're trying to understand what are we missing out on when that happens? Of course, we're missing out on gain. We know they can gain. We get average daily gains of uh, over a pound during that period. Um, but what are we missing out on when those animals don't even have the opportunity to grow? So one of the things that we know we're missing out on is muscle. So this is carcass ultrasound in the same group, um, very first group of calves that I showed you there. Um, we're looking at ribeye area here, just initial, our, our initial weight at, or, um, excuse me, ribeye area at about six days of age, and then an ultrasound measurement out at about 28 days of age, so four weeks. Um, and what we find is that those commercial plant nutrition calves just don't, we're not giving them enough to really grow that ribeye area. And so already at 28 days of age, we see a 17% improvement in ribeye area in those calves with that 1.8 pounds plant of nutrition and 26% greater ribeye area um, in those calves fed that high plant of nutrition. So we're not, we, there isn't enough nutrition in those very early or those very low planes of nutrition to build that ribeye area. And some of the things that we're interested in looking at in the future, and we are working on, are what is happening to the gut during that period when we're not providing them enough nutrition to grow? So in summary, we really want to make sure that we get it right from day one. And that is critical, not only for the calf, but also for the producer, as I showed you some of those cost per pound of gains. Early life nutrition can have a significant impact on long-term performance of our animals. So we have to make sure we're paying attention to how our young animals are being raised. Calves receiving commercial planes of nutrition lag in body weight growth, muscle accretion, and feed efficiency. And those are just some of our initial insights um, just from the outside and growing these calves. We have found that higher protein does mean greater and more efficient growth in these calves. Weaning later is better, and that's not specific to just crossbred. That's very general for our young animals. Um, just remember that, that beef, beef calf, she's going to wean them way, way further down the road. So even just a week going from seven weeks to eight weeks makes a very large difference in our, in our young animals. Um, and I beg the question, you know, when we feed commercial planes of nutrition, what do we think, we're, what, what are we missing out on? And that's something that we hope to answer in the future. All right, Allie, that is, that's it for me. So I think between uh, Dr. Spencer and I, I think we're probably ready for questions. Okay. Thank you, Olivia. That was great. Um, I don't, I don't know if Dr. Beck was going to hop back on. <laughs> And take care of questions, I think. So I'll turn yes, it over so to Dr. Beck. We do have some questions in the Q&A and chat. And, uh, we will... <laughs> we have one question on the uh, dry matter intake of the starter ration during the time frames when you were uh, feeding the milk replacer with those different solid levels. And how do that reflect with feed to gain and, and the cost to gain calculations 
with that grain component in the program? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, all of those animals, all of those milk replacer diets, all of them would have also been offered starter feed. Um, so that would all be included in the, the cost of uh, per pound of gain um, calculations that I showed you there. Um, in general, what we find is as we increase milk replacer feeding rate, especially if we go from 1.8 to 2.5 pounds, that tends to delay starter intake in our very young animals, which makes sense, especially those higher plant nutrition animals. They're not looking for the groceries like those lower fed calves are. Um, but one thing that I think is really critical is we found that as we increased from 1.2 pounds of milk nutrition up to 1.8 pounds of, um, in, in this case, our prime start milk replacer, um, we actually find that we don't decrease starter intake in those calves. So despite the fact that they're getting almost 0.6 pounds more per day dry matter from milk, those calves still are able and, and looking for groceries during that period. And some part of that is is critical, like the, the ratio between protein and fat is very important in how those calves will consume starter. So um, those calves still are consuming starter aggressively, uh, but they're getting the additional milk, which lets them be very efficient during that period. And going up to 1.8 pounds of milk still allows them to do that. Um, we will typically see starter intakes um, in a typical whole scene at weaning around 56 to 63 days. They tend to be in the three to four pounds. Um, per day, a lot of times in our crossbreds, we'll see them pretty easily at 5.6 or five to six pounds um, on an asset basis, pretty typical. Uh, another question. Oh, we've got, is there a problem with the audio? I, I can hear the audio fine. Okay. I'm hoping that everybody else. Uh, we have some others chiming in saying they have audio as well. So hopefully that's just a uh, uh, just a localized problem for those attendees. Um, the we have a question regarding the protein consumption data. Is that published, or do you have some references where it can be found? It is not published. Um, we are a commercial facility. Um, we are um, in collaboration with Allie, who I know I need to get some information to. We are working on publishing some of the data that we showed today, especially the data that goes all the way through finishing. Um, but we don't have published information related to that protein consumption data. Um, if you want uh, references and material, if you could reach out to your purine animal nutrition uh, specialist, that's probably the best place to start. So uh, we have a question here. Uh, this came in early in the uh, webinar. I'll let either one of you attempt to answer. How does the crude protein and NEG requirements compare between these beef on dairy calves and crossbred beef calves in grower diets? Uh, in this case, going from a 500 to a thousand pounds. Yeah, I'll let you take that, Olivia. Yeah, well, um, unfortunately, to this point, we have really focused on getting calves to 12 weeks of age, ideally 300 pounds. So we don't have a lot of, we don't have any research comparing um, Holstein or beef on dairy versus crossbred beef calves, unfortunately. Um, this is an area that we're certainly working on. And I, I I believe that some of the information that Allie will be able to share um, when she when, with some of our cats will help uh, give you some of this information. Um, but I, I don't have a good answer for you at this point. We also have um, uh, some of our nutritionists in the field that are working with some of these calves um, between that, that, that weight range that might be particularly helpful. But unfortunately, I don't have that answer today. So uh, there was a follow-up question, and, and I'll attempt to answer this. Based on some of our experience going post weaning in our research facilities, uh, where we're at the same time feeding some of these beef on dairy uh, and and uh, just straight beef calves, um, the intakes of what we're seeing dry matter intake by the beef on dairy calves is uh, you know 15 to 25 percent greater than what we'd expect compared just to a, a normal crush fed bred beef calf, um, which goes into some excellent performance, but, you know, that does decrease 
the percentage of crude protein that's probably needed in some of those diets. Um, uh, we would, if we uh, have those at the same level that we would expect to have for a beef calf, that would probably be adequate for these cattle. Uh, the, uh, yeah. um, I'll be talking about more of that in my presentation um, that first week of May. Um, so if you want to tune in for some more information on that, that's when I'll be going and talking about some of those more post weaning management's um, strategies that we're trying to implement. So the the follow up question is the dry matter intake differences we're seeing on eight hundred pound beef on dairy versus eight hundred pound uh, crossbred beef calves, or, and uh, you know we do have some data where it is right at 20, 20 to twenty five percent greater for those cattle at the same body weights. Um, another question, uh, Jennifer, when you mentioned 10% of body weight, um, as far as the quantity of the milk, I believe that was referring to the milk replacer. Is that amount of ounces they need or quarts on, on that? So it's for 10% of their body weight pounds. So think about, um, like a quart being two pounds. So 10% of, you know, 90 pound calf would be around four, a little over four um, quarts. So. Okay. Um, uh, question on individual calf water intake separate from water delivered via the milk replacer. Uh, any observations relative water delivery uh, systems via pail versus nipple, et cetera? Um, so we have not, not in these camps, we haven't measured um, individual calf water intake. Um, the critical points that I would say is that um, calves do need to be offered water and it needs to be separate from milk replacement. It needs to happen early. So we like to make sure that we're offering starter feed and free water at about three days of age that's going to encourage calves to consume to con consume starter, right? Because calves uh, feed intake follows water intake, and they're going to require at least one part, uh, four parts of water for every one part of um, of starter that they're going to consume. We tip we feed it in buckets, um, keeping it clean and making sure your water is high quality is very very important. These young calves tend to be more sensitive to water quality problems than our older animals might be. So if you're looking at livestock water analyses, um, it's important to understand there are there are options for calf water quality analyses out there um, because some of the standards that we have set for our adult cattle aren't really appropriate for our younger animals. They're just more sensitive to some of those quality problems. Um, but the most important thing is making sure that you offer it. A question from Beth, There's would there be a benefit to high fat content in milk replacer to complement the higher protein levels? Um, that's a great question. So when we talk about milk replacer protein to fat ratios, um, a lot of people are like, well, can I just feed more fat in my pro in my milk replacer and that, you know, that make my calves grow better, especially during the winter, that kind of thing. But when we're talking about milk replacer, um, we're really, the most critical thing is pounds of solids. So how much are you feeding? It's much more efficient and gives the calf way more energy to provide them more pounds of solids than to increase the percent fat in a milk replacer. Some of the reasons that we feed lower fat milk replacer than you would typically see in um, milk from a Holstein cow that's going to be somewhere in the ratio, or a beef cow at least is 27% crude protein and 30% fat on a dry matter basis. Um, unfortunately, we really need these calves to consume starter feed, right? Because we are going to wean them way earlier than mama cow would typically do that. And so those higher rates of fat, they typically slow down starter intake because fat induces more satiety. Um, so while fat can be very important um, and it, it, it's critical, I would say if you have the opportunity to choose between fat and pounds of solids, pounds of solids is in general better for the calf. Um, and then that higher fat will tend to reduce starter intake a little bit. So you might have to, if you want to feed more fat, um, you probably have to extend your weaning length a little bit. Um, I have a question that's 
something I've not ever thought of. Uh, any tips or things to watch for in starting cross calves in a grass fed only system where they're receiving milk as well, but they do not feed a, a starter mixed grain containing starter diet. Um, so they've had good luck so far, but are looking for ways to improve. Any, any thoughts on those? I don't know, Jennifer, if you wanted to, to talk on this or I can, if you'd like. Um, yeah, you want to go on it's that? Unique. Um, yeah, um, it's unique. You know, yeah, I mean, it's a great question. <laughs> it is, it's a great question. Um, I will consider this kind of like we consider hay feeding in our young animals. Um, and I will say that um, if, we're, if we're not providing that young animal kind of an, a nutrient dense starter feed, which is what they're going to be really good at digesting. They can digest hay. They're not, or I'm sorry, hay and, and grass. They can do it. Unfortunately, before eight weeks of age, the rumen is just really bad at being a rumen. It's not very efficient. The microbial population isn't really set up to digest feed appropriately. Um, and so when we provide an animal something that they really have to digest in their rumen versus kind of later in their gut, that's going to be more challenging in our younger animals. So not providing a nutrient-dense starter grain to those animals that are on milk probably is slowing down their growth. Um, in that situation, something to improve if you don't want to feed starter grain, which I, I, would, I would advise probably trying to add a creep feed or a starter grain to those young animals. That's really going to help those animals develop. Um, if you're not going to do that, you probably need to extend your weaning age way longer. Um, again, because they're just, they're, they're, their gut is really small. So we have a really great visual at our nutrition center. We bring people in um, because we have some plasticized four-week-old calf rumens. And if you hold that next to a pound of chopped hay, it just doesn't fit. They're very small. And so we like to have feed that has more nutrients in it for every, like, little grain, um, where it's something like pasture is going to be a lot less nutrient dense, so they can eat it, but they're not going to get nearly as much out of it. Um, so you're really going to be missing out on some of that very early growth. Yeah, and to go along with that, I mean, skeletal development needs to happen before, so definitely extending that weaning. Yeah. Uh, Getting and pounds of solids time. too, right? If you think about, again, think about what a beef cow might be providing to that calf. She's giving them between 2.2 to 3 pounds of solids per day, which is not what we typically feed our hand-fed calves. Uh, Follow-up question to one you addressed a little bit earlier. Um, as you said, a feed intake follows water intake. Would delivery of water be a pressurized system like a nipple tied to a pressurized line uh, conceivably increase water intake uh, and thus lead to increased dry matter intake? Um, that is a good question and one that I don't know the answer to. Um, I, there, I know that there is some information out there about feeding water through a nipple versus a bucket. Uh, I'm just not as familiar with that information. Um, so unfortunately, I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, I do think that, you know, there is some aspect of animals going through the normal process of drinking and, and getting free water into the rumen to start rumen development, some of that stuff. So nipple drinking might be a little different in that younger animal because the majority of that water will probably shunt um, into the reticulum maple orifice and right into the, the abomasum. So there might be some difference there, but I, I unfortunately don't have any better information on that for you. And I mean, I was thinking a little bit too, is you're kind of getting them used to what they're going to be seeing later on. I mean, you don't, I guess, necessarily want to wean them from milk and then also wean them from consuming water that way. That's a great point. Water. Yeah, absolutely. Because they're bad. We're, we're, we're making them go through a ton of changes when we mean them, right? We're saying, like, overnight, we're basically saying, you don't get milk anymore. You are a ruminant today. Congratulations. That's a big change um, and very different than what we would typically do in our, in our other ruminant animals. So absolutely, anything to your point that can reduce some of that change, that's helpful. And then one last question. Um, this one is fairly specifically uh, uh, for one region, but I, I guess it would could apply to all is 
Can you refer to any deer dairies near or in Arkansas that would uh, be breeding these dairy cows to beef cattle? Is there a clearinghouse or a, a way we can find dairies that are producing these calves so producers can access them? Uh, unfortunately, that's something that I don't know the answer to. Um, a lot of our technical services staff and some of the field staff would probably have a much better idea. Um, so those could be a resource for you, but I, I don't have anything better on that. There, there might be some uh, allied industry organizations that, that have those. Uh, Jennifer, are you aware of any? Um, I'm not, but um, I would say to reach out to the, the specialist in that area, because then they would know um, more of those that are using that system. So um, Arkansas, I don't, I think they've, They've got a specific dairy specialist, but um, I can look that up and let you know. Okay. 